A while ago, I did a video about the Poundland Globe LED lamps, and in particular the 3 watt and 5 watt ones, and they were quite interesting at the time because, unlike the typical Chinese LED lamps that just use a single LED chip in each LED and run it at high current by using a very high value capacitor, these ones were using six LEDs per six LED chips per LED. And that meant a much higher voltage across them, which meant that they could use a lower value capacitor. And they were also using the X2 capacitor, which is quite nice, a, a more a safer capacitor than the traditional red one. It's designed to fail in a safer manner. And at the time I was quite impressed, but I was a bit surprised that they were rating uh, one five watts and one three watts uh, and for basically the same PCB. And it turns out that the 5 watt ones were being pushed far too hard and people said that, if, particularly if they were put in an enclosed fixture, the LEDs pretty much desoldered themselves, they got that hot. And I did some experiments recently, I decided let's uh, play about with the value of the capacitor. So let's take a look at the schematic first of all. And this is all the data as well that I've actually accumulated from my experiments. So I'll just uh, tame the iPad down a bit. So the schematic is basically, you've got the capacitor with a resistor across the back of it going in and the capacitor value varies. With the 3 watt version it was a 470 nanofarad capacitor and with the 5 watt version it was a bigger um, 820 nanofarad capacitor and it's notable that they mounted both components off the circuit board so they obviously expected that there was going to be a lot of heat, per perhaps not as much as it turned out there was. So the, there was also between the um, circuit board and the base, there was a either, in some it was a resistor and others it was, seemed to be a small inductor and it was just basically, possibly the inductor was to reduce uh, interference noise, although there's not going to be much from a capacitive dropper. It's more likely that uh, it, it was just basically being used as a fuse in the input. But um, the... Limited supply then went through a bridge rectifier, got smoothed by a capacitor, and in the case of the the, um, the smaller lamp, the 3 watt, it was a 2.2 microfarad 4 volt capacitor. In the case of the higher power one, it was a 3.3 microfarad capacitor. Across that was a 100k discharge resistor, and then oddly, two 100 ohm resistors in parallel to create 50 ohms in series with this, this string of LEDs. And although, as I say, it looks just like 10 LEDs, it's actually 10 LEDs with 6 chips each, so there's a total of 60 LEDs in there. I should actually write that down. Oh, I have written it down. 60 LEDs with a combined forward voltage actually tested at 172 volts. But you'd expect roughly about 3 volts per LED, so it would be somewhere in the region of 180 volts. And um, if you do the maths then, that you've got about, say, 18 volts across each LED. And in the case of the 5 watt one, um, it was running... Um, 40 milliamps, 0 0.04 times the um, 18 volts meant that the package was dissipating 0.72 watts, roughly three quarters of a watt. And if you look at these packages, you know, you do get them rated to dissipate that amount of heat. But keep in mind, this is just bare printed circuit board laminate. It's not got the aluminium core. And although they've got the fairly chunky copper on it to actually try and spread the heat away, that's obviously been the downfall that, you know, that dissipating be the best part of a watt, basically, uh, in such a small chip without proper aluminium heat sinking, resulted in them overheating. The 3 watts seemed a lot better though, um, and ultimately if you consider that 3 watt was running them at 23 milliamps, 0 0.023 times 18 volts equals, it brings it under half a watt, which you still see, you know, it's pushing it for an ordinary LED, but you know what, these are designed for, for this sort of application. And they're sort of going for maximum light and not so much life as it used to be with the tr traditional LEDs that you'd just be aiming for a long lifespan. These ones, it really is just pushing it for maximum output. So anyway, uh, I've modified some lamps. I, th this is the base, the 3 watt version, and I have to say one of the hardest things about these lamps modifying them is getting the cover off in the first place. Because here's a here's the 10 watt one, and let's see if I can... 5 watt one, no, I think I've already... Yeah, I've already taken the cover off that one because it came off easily. But um, if I... Um, uh, have I got another one here? Really? The covers were just absolutely horrific 
they'd sometimes come off easily like that. Other times you'd be really squeezing and pulling to try and get them apart. But once they're apart, um, I'll just shove this one back together. No, I won't. I'll get that later. Once they're apart, to get them open, you have to get rid of this silicon goop around the side. And the only way to do that is just gouge it out with a screwdriver. I'll put this out of the way at the moment just to provide better contrast. And once you've done that, uh, the circuit board still doesn't come out easily. Now keep in mind these were from Poundland in the UK and as such they've got our bayonet cap lamp holder in the back. It's worth mentioning that uh, in the British bayonet cap and uh, other countries use it as well, the only connections that are made are onto the end, the live and neutral, are hot and return, are on the end. This is not live. You could technically touch it while the lamp's powered up and it won't be live. Some of the holders are in fact metal uh, and some of them are earthed as well, grounded. I just thought I'd mention that because some people have asked. So um, you pop this uh, glue out like this. And the reason I mentioned the bayonet cap thing there was because uh, this is very much a... I'm going to show you how to actually get the, the wires out the back of that because um, to release the wires, because the circuit board itself won't pop out, uh, it will come out to a degree. Ooh. Yeah, it's well glued in. But that's about as far as it will come out. It won't really want to come out that much more. And at that point you could get, you know, you could still access and some of them you could get in to cut wires or you could even at that you could desolder components and this you know this one's quite generous and relative to the others but if you need to get the wires out the back with these ones instead of being soldered in then they, they've just basically these little caps and if you get a pair of generic cheapy snips not your good ones and you just grip it by the side and just prise then these will come out these little rivets and uh, when they come out they kind of release the wire and suddenly the whole lot drops out um, let's see if this one has the choke or the resistor in it. Let's uh, just slip that open. So this one has a resistor. I could actually just have measured that from the outside, couldn't I? I've, I've, I hope, hopefully I've not slipped right through it. Let's try and measure it. It's going to be a low value. I think it's really just being used as a fuse. So I'm going to aim for the 200 ohm range here. Clamp one wire there and put the other wire onto there. And see if I can get a reading at all. I think I've actually damaged that resistor. Nope, nope, there it goes. Uh, it's a 5.6 ohm resistor, or 5-ish. 5 to 5.6. 5 5.6 5 is a standard value. So it is really, it's just a metal film resistor that's kind of being used as a fuse. Not very easy reading the colour code, but that's largely because I've, I've scraped it. And also, it's very dark background. I've always found the resistors are very hard to read. Uh, Oh, actually, it's yellow-violet. It's 4.7 ohms. Yellow-violet-gold. I've always found the best resistors to read are the carbon film resistors because they've got that nice warm-coloured background. All the colours shop really well. If you get metal film resistors like grey or blue, it sometimes it makes the colours look so dark that they're actually quite hard to differentiate. But anyway, I decided, uh, if you open your lamp like this, you can change this capacitor. And I put a, a whole load of, I just put one of every value I had in, which was from 100, well, I didn't go below 100 nanofarad. I could have gone below 100 nanofarad. Uh, I think I did try that, and it was just starting to get too dim. But uh, the when I changed them, these were the results. I, I did uh, various tests. I measured power, current, and temperature, and it's interesting that for every watt, it was generating roughly 20 degrees Celsius on these LEDs. So by the time you got up to the 5 watt, even in my cold house, my cold workshop, it was still 105 degrees Celsius, or centigrade, whichever you want to call it, Celsius for the uh, LED temperature, and that's just too hot. If the whole package is at that temperature, you know, it's, it's really going to be even hotter than the chips inside. When you came down to the 3 watt one, um, it was down to 56 degrees Celsius, and that's not bad, actually. I mean, I would consider these days, uh, I would say 75 degrees Celsius is 
tolerable for an LED, a working LED, something that's really earning its keep. But um, I prefer them to run cooler. But, you know, when I was young, the LEDs there just stayed stone cold because, well, that's all they were capable of. But these ones are optimised now. They're more engineered for higher temperature applications. The 330 nanofar, this was the first uh, value I'd swapped in, came in uh, with a power, dis a power output of 2 watts and uh, 16 milliamps and 42 degrees Celsius, which is actually, that's really good. And then from there, it wasn't even worth measuring the temperature. It dropped down to sort of roughly ambient temperature. The 220 nanofar uh, drew 1.3 watts. The 100 nanofar was 0.5 watts and 4 milliamps. But um, it's worth mentioning at this point in time that that's when this resistor became an issue because by default, it's dropping, it's passing, say the, the voltage across these is the 172 volts. The current that's flowing through that is going to be, well, let's uh, calculate it. I equals V, which is 172 volts. So it helps you turn it on, 172 volts. Uh, divided by 100 thousand ohms. And that means that that's actually passing 1.7 milliamps, which, you know, it's not that bad. It's not a dramatic amount of current, except when you're running it at low levels and 4 milliamps is, you know, going to be affected by 1.7. It's going to take almost half the sort of current away. And uh, so for that, this one, I uh, actually melted the solder and just slid that resistor off where is it there that's where its pads were i just slid it off which means it now holds a charge uh, of about 150 volts when you turn it off and also when you turn it off instead of going out instantly it fades away gently um and of course because there's nothing to clamp it down um when the helps so i put it in the correct way around there's a wee notch uh, when that resistor also helps clamp down any leakage. Uh, a, f a few people have mentioned they're experiencing that thing where, you know, you plug a light, uh, and a new LED lamp in, and then you turn all the lights off and it's still glowing dimly at night because of the capacitive coupling between the switch wires is, is enough. You know, it wouldn't have ever showed up with the old tungsten lamps, but it's enough to make these ones glow just that tiny little bit. But that's... Uh, that resistor normally helps attenuate that effect and also make sure it makes sure it goes out quickly. But um, in this case, you know, I desoldered it. It's just it's removed that effect. But um, the interesting thing is that this is the 0.5 watt one, and you think well, that's not going to be very bright, but it is actually bright. I've been using this. I've just left it on 24/7 in my sort of entrance area at the front door, and it's. You know, you could just, you could read a book happily under it. It's, it lights the whole entrance area at just half a watt. Um, initially, I tried a higher wattage lamp. I thought it was a wee bit actually too bright, but the half watt's just ideal for just illuminating places. That, you know, it's actually almost, it would be too bright for a night light, actually. Uh, the 1.3 watt is starting to get even brighter. Um, and... Uh, the 2 watt uh, is a good functional intensity. Um, so I think the best bit about this experimentation was finding the temperatures that they were running at and how as the current increases it really it, it's quite dramatic the difference um, in the temperature and how much damage it can do to the LEDs. When you underrun the LEDs, when you modify them and you just run it down, say in this case the half watt's only running at 4 milliamps, the LEDs will be more efficient at that lower current and they're going to last for a very, very long time. Yeah, they're going to last for probably about 10 times or longer than even the sort of 3 watt one would have, probably more. Um, you know, it could last virtually 10 years or something like that, I'd guess. I'm not sure which components would degrade first. Maybe the capacitor, it would uh, suffer the sort of film failure or something like that over time. Um, I suppose ultimately time will tell uh, with the reliability of LED lamps. But yeah, the lower power ones, I do, you know, it's a really quite an easy hack to make in these lights uh, and it, it just turns them into a completely different beast. It makes them just that very low energy lamp, uh, which is just... Nice, actually. I do like like that. But yeah, that was quite fun, just doing sitting down and, you know, just logging all this information because uh, it, it just uh, shows you how the capacitance affects current and the temperature. Um, but yeah, good stuff.